All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the seventh annual Women in Non-Binary Bike Summit presented by Dollar Bank. My name is Sarah Quinn and I am the membership and outreach manager and Women in Non-Binary program organizer at Bike Pittsburgh. For those of you who aren't familiar, Bike Pittsburgh is a member-based bicycle and pedestrian advocacy organization that believes in the basic right to safe non-motorized transportation for a high quality of life. We believe that biking should be safe and comfortable for everyone. Dollar Bank generously signed on to support not just today's event, but a series of coffee meetups and educational opportunities throughout the year. So thank you to Dollar Bank for continuously backing this program and believing in the vision of a more inclusive bicycling community. I am here today with three incredible keynote speakers, Monica Garrison, Diana Hildebrand, and Shaquaya Bailey for an open discussion about equity, diversity, and inclusion in the bicycling community. But before we begin, I would like to go over just a few housekeeping items. All right, so the first being, um, take time to gather anything you might need. So water, coffee, snacks, make yourself comfortable. Um, next thing is that you can leave video on or off. We'd love to see your faces, um, but you gotta do what's best for you. Um, we recommend that you turn on speaker view by selecting the small gray square in your upper right hand corner. That might be your left, but <laughs> my left, your right. Um, this way your screen will display the relevant speaker when they are presenting. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end of our presentations. So feel free to chat your questions, comments as you think of them to Kea. She is on the account labeled Bike PGH Moderator. So you'll see that in the chat on your bottom bar. And the last thing to note is that all of our Zoom sessions will be recorded. So don't worry if you have to head out a little bit early. And the other thing I would like to review before we get started is our community agreements. As we know, historically underrepresented and marginalized groups continue to face inequities throughout our country and here in Pittsburgh. And Bike Pittsburgh's Women Non-Binary Group is our program is inclusive as cis women, intersex people, non-binary, gender queer, trans, agender, and gender variant folks, as well as those whose gender identity falls outside of the dominant conceptions of gender. And this program encourages conversation and provides spaces to come together over biking, advocacy, and related topics while increasing representation of people with historically marginalized gender identities. We aim to create a safe space where people can speak freely, expressing themselves authentically without the added fear of microaggressions and discrimination. So with all these community agreements here in mind, let's get started. We have invited several incredible speakers here today um, in the local bicycling community. And one of those leaders is Monica Garrison. Um, Monica is the founder of Black Girls Do Bike, an incredible organization which started as an idea to connect lady cyclists and has since turned into a movement with more than 90 inclusive riding groups all over the country. I've always been inspired by Monica's willingness to challenge power structures, racism and sexism inside and outside of the larger bicycling community. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Monica Garrison. Hello everyone, good morning. It is bright and early. Um, happy to be here, happy to be uh, on this uh, amazing panel. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here so we can get started. Good. <clears throat> okay, so uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with Black Girls Do Bike, uh, I'll give you a quick summary. Uh, I am the, the founder of the organization. I'm from Pittsburgh, grew up in the Lincoln Lemington section of town, graduated from Robert Morris University. And uh, other than a few years spent in the Northern suburbs, I've spent most of my life here in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, <clears throat> I never considered getting around town by bike as an adult until my late twenties when I lived in Greenfield and discovered that uh, the Eliza Furnace Trail was close. And that helped me save money and get to and from work pretty much stress-free. Um, and even though there were long stretches where I was not actively cycling, I've always kind of found my way back to cycling as a way to connect with others and enjoy the outdoors. So in 2013, 
I returned to writing um, as a way to relieve stress and a way to connect with my little ones. But after the summer of writing, I realized that I saw very few women of color on bikes and I started to engage um, in Bike Pittsburgh events. Um, I remember doing bike parking at like the arts festival and a couple pirate games. Um, and what I found was there was a really an amazing cycling community in Pittsburgh, but there were very few people of color that I encountered. So I turned to the internet to find my tribe and was a bit disappointed because there was really a lack of representation there. So I decided to create an online space um, where an online space where women um, could connect over their love of cycling. And um, I named it Black Girls Do Bike uh, with the uh, with a positive spin, hoping that we would find this community. And we, our mission became clear very quickly, which was to grow and support a community of women who shared a passion for cycling. But I didn't really have an idea of, of what I would find or how diverse or enthusiastic the community would turn out to be. And what was intended to solely be an online space has now turned into um, more than 90 groups around the country, including Alaska, and the Caribbean. So we are working to make bicycling uh, more inclusive. Um, and we do this by fostering a supportive environment overall. And uh, our riders are not required to pay membership fees. Um, we have a monthly friendly no drop ride. All of our chapters are required to have these rides. Um, and sometimes they don't even need a bike because we'll start our rides at a uh, bike share station so that they have access to a bike. And all we ask is that ladies show up, that they have a helmet and a desire to uh, have a good time and learn. Um, and we ask them to invite other women as well in their lives to join in in the fun with us. So our goal is to break down barriers for these ladies and kind of be the on-ramp to the larger cycling community. And women tell us that they don't know where to begin sometimes, they need strategies. Um, they don't feel safe riding alone. They hope for more protected roadways and safer places to park their bikes. Um, but there are also some things that may be unique to women of color that you may not have thought about. Sometimes women of color say, well, I never learned to ride. I didn't have a bike as a child, um, or I can't find a helmet to fit my thick, curly, natural hair. Um, or I feel unsafe as a brown body on a bike riding in traffic. I don't know how I'm going to be perceived by um, by driver. So we encourage strategies to kind of overcome these obstacles and these fear, fears, um, but we also encourage them to become volunteers and advocates so that they can fight for change in their communities. So at the heart of what we do are our sheroes, and pictured here is uh, our local Pittsburgh hero, Robin Woods. And these women are really passionate. They have a strong desire to help others develop a love for cycling. They ride to raise awareness for um, a ton of worthy causes. And ultimately they're volunteers. Um, they moderate our online community. They lead rides. Um, they network with local shops and, and organizations. And they really keep their finger on the pulse of what's going on in the larger um, cycling community and um, help me do that as well. And um, these women are all over the country. They're joining advisory boards, committees. Uh, they're engaged in decision-making about who uh, and how and when people can ride bikes. And the goal hopefully is to create an army of women of color who are bike advocates. So as you probably are aware, uh, 2020 has been a challenge for everyone. Um, the pandemic kind of swept in and created a lot of uncertainty around um, uh, our lives and cycling and a lot of instability. And uh, early on, we weren't sure how the virus spread and we made a really tough decision to cease Black, Girl, Black Girls Do Bike group rides um, until further notice. But uh, the silver lining is that uh, kind of like a phoenix, we're rising out of the ashes of 2020 um, heading into 2021, and we're finding that people are spending a lot more time outdoors. And um, cycling has become popular. If you've tried to purchase a bike recently uh, from a major bike brand, you'll find that uh, a lot of things are back ordered until spring. 
And um, so how are we benefiting? Well, our membership has swelled um, in social media circles is also our groups. Uh, our YouTube channel is growing. We started uh, what we call the Bike Girl Magic series, which my two co-panelists are have already been interviewed for that series. And I encourage you to check out their interviews. They're very um, inspiring. We have got, given away a ton of products and five bikes this year to ladies around the country. And mid-year, uh, during the pandemic, we actually entered into a partnership with USA Cycling that we think will have far reaching uh, implications for us and for cycling as a whole in terms of um, diversity and inequality. Um, and this year, uh, we were honored to be nominated, but also named the Bike Club of the Year by the League of American Cyclists, Bicyclists. Um, and even uh, we started our first international chapter this year with Black Girl Blue Bike London. So that's a, certainly a milestone that we've been reaching for for quite some time. So happy to say that we reached that goal. I wanna share a brief story, um, not necessarily a unique story, but a story of one of our sheroes. This is Stephanie Puello. She is um, the shero of Black Girls Do Bike Denver, Colorado. And she was actually highlighted this month on bicycling.com. Um, she started using her bike after college to commute and for runs to the grocery store. She was relatively new to cycling when she took on the task of um, completing the Transamerica Trail uh, with her partner. And um, she came back from that ride uh, newly invigorated with a, a sense of accomplishment and appreciation uh, for what her, her body had allowed her to accomplish. Um, and then after the death of George Floyd, she helped organize and lead a ride for justice in Denver. Um, they expected 30 or 40 riders and uh, hundreds showed up. And uh, the chapter gained a lot of national attention because of that ride. And now she organizes a, a standing ride for uh, called the Denver Solidarity Ride. And in her own words, I'll read to you. She says, my shtick has been increasing diversity and representation within cycling. It's a pretty homogenous sport, especially in a pretty homogenous state like Colorado. But through this organization, it's been very gratifying to work with other organizers and Black cyclists in the Denver area. And we've reclaimed authorship of our narratives and redefined what a cyclist looks like. So I've spoken to Stephanie. She is um, she's very inspiring to, to talk to. She has a lot of energy and her enthusiasm has spilled over into others in her town. And now she just last month added two, no, two new co sheroes uh, Brooke and Crystal, and they are eager, eager to help her reach more women. And as you can see, um, they are, among other things, mountain bikers. So they'll definitely broaden the type of cycling that we can, we can highlight um, in, the, in the organization. So you may be asking yourself, um, how can I help? Uh, and even though we're seven years into this journey, I think it really still feels like a grassroots movement for us. And we need to continue to grow and further the mission because there are a lot more women and girls that we want to help get on bikes. So the first thing you can do is spread the word. Tell other people, um, not just people of color, but other people that you meet about us. You can also lend your time, your expertise um, to your local chapter. And um, you can certainly contribute monetarily or purchase some of our cool gear or swag from the Black Girls Do Bike shop. Um, but ultimately, what I'm happy to report um, now is that we have a voice at the table. You know, we've gathered some amazing partners along the way, like REI and Trek Bikes, um, to extend our reach. And I consider these companies heavyweights in the cycling community. So it's good to, um, you know, have a voice at the table and be able to speak on behalf of people of color in cycling to these um, to these companies. And some of our goals looking forward include working to develop programming to introduce young girls to riding. And for our ladies who are competitors, we are starting a Black Girls Do Bike race team. And we wanna have members from all over the country to join the team. Uh, so in conclusion, um, my focus is women of color because I obviously am a woman of color. And I think uh, we seem to be a little bit neglected and, and the least uplifted uh, of the community. And so I think it's important to tell these stories. And it's important for you to know that people of color do ride bikes. Um, they are discovering cycling at all ages and all economic levels. Um, and I think 
people just desire to see themselves reflected in the content that they consume. And, um, and that's where Black Rosie Bike comes in. We help people see themselves in cycling. That's it. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, that was an incredible presentation and all the stories that you shared today. Um, I feel like we will have many more um, people looking to join your rides, whether they're virtual or in person soon. Great. Sweet, is that now sharing? Mm -hmm. Cool. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for joining. Uh, it is a pleasure to uh, be here. And my name is Shaquia Bailey. My pronouns are she, her. And just a, a little bit about me. So I am from Pittsburgh. I uh, grew up in uh, Larmer. And I uh, went to Peabody High School, which is now Pittsburgh Obama. Um, went to Penn State and uh, lived in Atlanta for a little bit and came back, kind of boomerang back to Pittsburgh. And when I came back, um, I was like, well, how can I get around without having to, you know, catch the bus? At the time, I didn't have a car. So I just uh, picked up a bike because that was something I easily did in college. And then um, I just kind of started biking around just to get um, from A to B. Um, and I, through my, you know, just commuting and just getting around, I ended up connecting with uh, someone on a, a bike ride we did. We actually, we did a ride and during that ride, we were just like, oh, we're just gonna ride uh, down Freeport Road and then just go from there. We didn't necessarily have like a route planned and um, she ended up bonking, which uh, I didn't know what that was called at the time, but she hit a wall and I ended up in doing 60 miles by accident that day. And then after that ride, um, she ended up telling this guy, his name was Bruce Woods. And I was like, uh, she was like, yeah, this guy, you know, uh, my boyfriend works with him. And um, he's like, you gotta come meet them and eat Liberty at this bike shop uh, called Performance Bikes, because uh, you sound like you should link up with them. Turns out that guy, Bruce Woods, was the president of um, Pittsburgh Major Taylor. And so uh, like I linked up with them and they were like, um, if you ride with us, you gotta wear a helmet. Cause I wasn't even wearing a helmet then. And uh, I was like, ooh, a helmet? And he handed me this ugly helmet and I wore it and I was like, well, how many people didn't wear this thing? Cause I don't know, I just get kind of funny about <laughs> putting on stuff as other people's. And so uh, after that ride, I ended up buying my own helmet that looked good and matched my bike. Um, and from that point on, I was pretty much hooked on at least being a safe rider um, was like, it was the start. And once I started riding with them, I just started like learning a lot more about uh, the cycling world and start picking up other things. Um, and then pretty much through them, I connected to um, like ACA and a few other things that I'll like uh, touch on. But uh, so more about me, uh, so commuter origins and through a couple other things, I started racing and eventually became the uh, Pittsburgh Major Taylor president as of this year. Um, in terms of how I give back to my community. Um, I'm a mentor at uh, Major Force Youth, which is a program under Major Taylor and also with Pittsburgh Youth Leadership, um, which is a program run by Mark Rubenstein. Um, he is uh, based out of the uh, Urban Academy um, in uh, Garfield, I believe. Um, and then also, as of 2020, a member of the Black Foxes, a collective of Black cyclists, and uh, for how I get my money, uh, <laughs> I'm a director of operations at Grounded Strategies. Um, and I'm also a member of the LGBT community. So I feel like I should also say that, as well as being obviously Black. So um, I get, represent a lot of facets, um, and I'm just super excited to be here today. Um, so that's the next slide. Um, so yeah, so those are some of the, my many hats of uh, being a 
a member and president of Major Taylor, uh, helping to facilitate the um, Major Force Youth Program. And uh, the new endeavor is to being a member of the Black Foxes. Um, um, so more specifically, uh, Pittsburgh Major Taylor Cycling Club uh, has been around since 2004. Uh, it was started by uh, six individuals, Mario, Steven, uh, Will, Ken, Daryl, and Tim Younger. I only met Mario and Will. Um, so these other folks, I don't know them, but um, I do appreciate them for what they began and what they started. So they wanted to introduce cycling to the black community as a way to uh, develop skills, overall health benefits, and to just have a way to socialize in a positive way. Um, these individuals also ended up starting a youth program. It didn't necessarily have a name um, back then. Um, they partnered with Faison uh, Elementary School and we actually used to do bike trips um, along the Gap Trail uh, with youth after uh, training and working with them. And through that experience, that's pretty much how the Major Force Youth Program started. Um, after that, kind of sunsetted. Um, we were working with a teacher to facil facilitate that um, endeavor, but that teacher actually left the school. And so a lot of times, I'm, I'm sure if anyone's worked with youth and worked with schools, uh, programs only succeed if you have someone within the school to help push the mission forward. And so when that teacher left, we said, well, we still, the, pro the club said, well, we still wanted to give back in some way. How can we support the cycling and um, maybe a year or two later, they ended up uh, starting the Major Force Youth Program. Um, and that first iteration was with the Kingsley Center and with their youth um, in, in regards to that. Let's see, let me go to the next slide since we're talking about Major Force Youth. Um, and so through that program, it officially started in 2015. Um, and we encourage and empower uh, predominantly, I think all the kids, yeah, all the kids have been uh, black kids and no matter where we've located it. And through that program, we encourage them to uh, ride bikes. We give them a brand new bike. We give them gear, um, teach them the ins and outs, teach them safety. Um, and at the end of the program, they keep everything that they've received with the program in addition to the uh, brand new bicycle. Um, this is also the the major impetus for us uh, having the three-state ride, which is now called the McDermott three-state ride after uh, one of our fellow cyclists, uh, Mike McDermott, was riding home on his bicycle and was killed by a driver. Um, so we renamed the ride after, the three-state ride after uh, Mike McDermott. And so that three-state ride pretty much funds the youth program. Uh, we've had some instances of funders who have given us grants to support that program uh, over the years, but predominantly the, the club ride, uh, McDermott Three State funds the Major Force Youth Cycling Program. Um, all of the members uh, and all, mem all the members of the club are awesome. We have several folks who are ride leaders as a part of uh, Major Taylor. Um, and that's pretty much how we are able to lead so many rides for so long. Um, we just have a great group of cyclists um, who donate their, their time um, to give back and lead the rides that we have um, throughout the year. Uh, currently, the ride season goes from about March, late March to October, um, as far as official rides go. At the rider levels, they vary um, for Major Taylor, they vary from like, really easy with the slow rolls um, that I began a couple years ago. Um, they begin um, at the Kingsley Center and they typically start a push off at 6 p.m. Um, two Mondays a month. Um, then we have the uh, OTB rides, um, which have sunset it for the season as of, I believe, like last week. Um, those are a city ride um, that occurs in the evening on Wednesdays. And that is a way we could just kind of quickly decompress after work and, and ride with other, your, other fellow riders. 
And then we have Rise on the Weekend, that vary uh, as far as like skill level, length, terrain, and the starting point. Um, the club has uh, definitely, I would say they're, you know, now that we're you know, in our teens, um, or at least close to, we have a lot of experienced cyclists, but we're always looking to add more and have more outreach to a lot of our black cyclists. As the club has grown, we've noticed, cause we do accept all, all persons of all like backgrounds. Um, as the club has grown, I've noticed that we've kind of had a little bit of a disconnect from our black community. And I think um, initially it was probably because as you get more riders of higher skill level, then they end up going riding faster, longer and harder. And so you have that like slight disconnect. And so that's kind of where my impetus of starting the slow rolls a couple of years ago uh, began and having it at the Kingsley Center so that the people in my community can see that we are riding and we are here. And to also have like a chill ride where everyone can actually ride together and talk as opposed to like, riding super hard and fast and not necessarily having time to collect and just uh, enjoy each other's company. Um, yeah, so um, Major Taylor uh, is always, if you wanna join, feel free. We do have a low cost of entry. It's uh, $27 and that pretty much allows us to continue to have like rides and um, we do bike 101s and we also have picnics, holiday pick, uh, holiday gatherings, uh, this COVID this year. So not exactly sure how the holiday thing will go. Um, we, we may not do that, um, just for, for safety reasons and, you know, can't be, uh, endured with a whole lot of people, but, uh, you know, next year, next year we're trying to do, you know, bigger and better as long as it's safe. Um, and then for the major force youth cycling program, um, right now, uh, this year, we we did postpone the program for quite a few months, but about a month or so ago, we restarted with about eight youth um, from, we are, right now we're based out of the north side location of youth places. And so we have about eight young people who are riding and we have one who didn't even know how to ride a bike. Um, so we had a one young man, we actually taught how to ride a bike and is now riding with the group at a, you know, slower level, but we're still excited to have that occurring. Um, so we will, we'll be able to have a graduate, uh, a few youth for this season, albeit just late in the season because of everything that has happened. Um, and hopefully next year we'll be able to grow that program a bit more. And I, I have some ideas about where that can go, but don't want to speak on it too soon. Um, but yeah, so if you're, if you're looking to support Major Force Youth, you can always um, donate a time. Um, you can donate um, either a fiduciary. And also we are always welcome to donations of like clothing and gear and lights and things like that for the kids' uh, bikes. And we do provide all that, but it's good to be able to hand those out um, throughout the year, especially kids lose things. And so the kids would judge us and say, hey, we, you know, we lost something and we replace something. We will we'll pay for that. And our next group is uh, the Black Foxes. So this is a new endeavor that was um, started by Will, actually, Will and Aisha. And we came together to we really wanted to show that Black people are out here riding, biking, um, and hiking, skiing, just whatever that, whatever you could do outside, we want to show that, you know, we're here, we're doing that, and we wanted to show a positive representation of that. Um, so the people in this group, I actually only knew um, one of them prior to the uh, start of the group. Um, but I have found that the people in the group are just absolutely phenomenal. Everyone is a powerhouse in their own right. Um, but yeah, so the whole point is to uh, come together uh, and ride bikes, have fun, or just come together in any way that is in an outdoors way. Um, 
and we want to show that you know we control our own narratives we define we refuse to be defined and scrutinized by those who do not share our love and struggle and story within the realm of cycling and outdoor spaces um and we also just want to be a positive representation to black people so that um there are you know sort of kids that can see that you know there's black people riding hiking skiing um skating um which i'm glad to see is making a resurgence um unfortunately due to covid but you know you gotta take the silver lining out of whatever whatever there is um we just want to normalize blackness and cycling in outdoor spaces um we also want to erase the white savior mentality um that has kind of come with um this this industry of outdoor spaces um and we want to be the ones to the trailblaze and and tell people what we want um and how we want to do things as opposed to someone saying hey you know um i got you here's what we could do as opposed to like let's flip it on its head and say no this is what we want to do um but yeah so and we also want to um create a rapport with other industry leaders and we want to see more of uh, black individuals, black, brown, indigenous folks in, um, in front of the screen and behind it. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of like the focus of the Black Foxes. Um, and oops, uh, let's see what else. Just to summarize, because I can just keep talking. But uh, to summarize, um, if you want to either join uh, Major Taylor for a ride or just learn more about the club, you can check us out on our website. Um, we also have Facebook, Instagram. And if you wanna reach out to the Black Foxes, um, we have Instagram. And if you just wanna reach out to me and follow what I'm doing, um, my Instagram is do stimples. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you, Shaquaya. Really appreciate it. Um, for the sake of time, we are going to connect Diana here via audio. Uh, Diana. Hi, how are you? Good, good. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, thank you all for your patience with our tech. Um, I am going to share Diana's presentation here and we will get to it. First, I would like to say that I am proud to be a part of this um, summit and be a part of this um, panelist group with two amazing women that I have met along my cycling journey. So um, once again, I'm glad to be here. I'm Diana Hildebrand. I am the founder, creative director and consultant of Diva D Cycling. Um, how did Diva D start, Cycling start? Well, I just moved to Cleveland. Me and my family moved around for a while and um, just moved to Cleveland, Ohio at the time. And I was a semi pro um, football player, wide receiver, corner and safety. And after um, receiving so many injuries and broken bones, um, moving here to Cleveland, I was able to find cycling. Basically, how did I find cycling? I kept seeing these bike lanes. I'm like, oh my God, there's bike lanes. What is that? Um, next from there, I was like, okay, now I want to join this. And I started looking into groups and organizations to get into. At the age of 36, I started riding a bike, 36 years of age. I felt like I knew exactly what to do. Um, I did not. So um, I met Black Girls Do Bike, Slow Road Cleveland, um, and um, Black Girls Do Bike had like a collaborative bike ride with Major Taylor Cleveland, and I joined. I was not the best, but I wanted to be. I wanted to be one of the strong riders. So over the summer, and I mean, over the winter, I learned how to become a, a, a really good cyclist. When I tell you being a football player, jumping into cycling, it was not easy. I had to learn new things, my, my muscle groups, the whole nine. Um, but from there, cycling became a passion, just like it did with football. I was a football coach. Um, I talked about football and I was given a second chance to translate it into cycling. So um, with that being said, I decided that cycling was changing my life and I wanted to change other people's lives two wheels at a time. And that's how I came up with that model, changing lives two wheels at a time. Because when I found cycling, I was looking for something new to do. 
I was depressed. I was a stay at home mom. I was new. I moved away from my family. So it was my outlet. It was my release. It was my therapy. And so I wanted to give people that I met the same opportunity. From there, um, I decided to just post out there before I knew anybody, just any town that I went to or any city that I went to, I was I was asking people, hey, I'm out on a bike ride, come join me. And people started responding. Um, after that, I went to a Black Girls Do Bike meetup and had the opportunity to meet some representatives through Trek. And after that, I became a Trek women's advocate. They believed in my goals. They believed in my mission. They believed that um, I wanted to get more women on bikes more women of color on bikes and more families of colors on bikes and connected to the trails and the great outdoors. Because the way I was raised, I was raised to be outside. I was hiking, I was bird watching, I was gardening. I was learning things from my great grandparents and my grandma and my mom and my dad as well. So with all that being said, I decided to quit my accounting job and fully focus on cycling. I would be at work and I would talk to a person on how to fix the flat because it was on a bike ride and they caught a flat. And my time at work was more spent on talking about bikes than crunching numbers. So I gave myself a goal and I quit my job and a year and so months later, here I am um, working with organizations, talking to people, diving deep into the community, trying to um, speak about uh, sustainability, social injustice, just transportation barriers and everything else that comes along with the community. And since I'm here in the Cleveland area, I fully focus on that. And I also need to say like, I appreciate COVID because COVID, before COVID, I was traveling around doing stuff with cycling. I was before COVID, I was living in Pittsburgh. I was making a living there. I was working for a great organization called Noble Invention Bike Tours. And I was able to speak with people and talk to people about getting on the trails and riding on the trails and what is needed to prepare for that type of bike ride. But due to COVID, I decided to come back to Cleveland and really be around my family. And that gave me the opportunity to dive deep and really start focusing on the community here. With that, I started doing um, community engagements, offering bike rides. And within those bike rides, I would talk to people and I would hear about the issues that we ha they were having in their community. After that, I was like, how can I help? I joined Black, um, Bike Cleveland. With Bike Cleveland, they have an advocacy program. Um, they're focused on safer streets, transportation for everybody. And with that being said, it just nurtures something something inside of me that made me want to do this even more. And I had a greater purpose within the Cleveland area and Ohio in general. So with Bike Cleveland, I do education. I ride through communities. I do community engagement. And the programs that we're trying to start now is trying to bring um, community advocates, advocates from low-income communities who, who who are looking for something to do, how we how can we get them engaged on a grander scale instead of just that little neighborhood that they in and how can they be a voice to a grander scale and make changes within their community such as bike lanes, lighting on the street, safer um, crosswalks for people because in most of these communities, there's no street lights. The painting on the crosswalks, you can barely see them and people are dying dying because they're getting hit by cars. People are not paying attention. So the main goal in these communities is um, visibility, sustainability, education. And then I started working with University Circle Inc. University Circle Inc, we teamed up together and we started a program or they had a program called um, Pedal with Police and they put me on board with that. Um, and I was able, we was able to um, give away 20 bikes to five schools um, during the summer, COVID summer, and we were giving kids bikes. And while they were in the summer program, um, learning about sustainability, the sewer district, um, Lake Erie, I was able to jump in and offer education about the community, um, the youth that are in these programs, talking with police officers, how can we continue with this process moving forward? So with that being said, there's a big program initiative that is happening in 2021 with community engagement and police engagement and bridging the gap. 
Next, we have Lorain County Metro Parks, which I'm very excited to talk about this because they have a Girls and Gears program that launched last year. And um, this year and going and moving forward, I am proud to be a part of this group, getting girls on bikes because I'm also working with NICA Grid Ohio. NICA is the National Interscholastic Cycling Association and Grid is girls riding together. And we're coming together and we're trying to get more girls on bikes, teaching them empowerment that they can do this. And there are our future, there are future cyclists. And we wanna get women, young ladies from all age groups all racial backgrounds, everything. We want them to come together and have fun on two wheels. Also by doing that, they can show their families that they can do things for them. Grocery shop, run errands, go to school. There's no excuse now saying, oh, I'm late to school because I couldn't find a way to get there. You, the kids have a bike. And with that, the, we need more bikes to help these kids um, continue to move forward, meaning break any barriers or um, have access to getting places without depending on their parents or saying they don't have the funds because most of the kids do not have the money to get to where they need to be and they're on foot, which is dangerous. But there's a community that has beautiful bike lanes, but where are we getting these bikes? So the goal is with um, this is to, how can we come together and make these resources available for everybody. So I thought about this and I'm thinking of the mindful, the mindful project. My, my goal, what my hopes are for the cycling community here in the Cleveland area. So with that being said, let's dive deep into it. Let's talk about enhancing focus and productivity. What is that? The goal is to strategically um, plan rides within underserved communities offer training to community advocates, as well as um, bringing in revenue and supporting black owned businesses. Educate and understanding, providing education, giving education to the community, letting them know about our bike laws, helping them um, change the face of legislation, being able to submit information to the league, how they can create bike lanes, how can we make the streets safer, how can we be more inclusive in the bike, bicycling community locally, as a state, and nationally. And then my next thing is jumping into um, organizations where nine times out of 10, I am the only woman of color in these spaces. And I am talking about these communities. How can we make a change? How can we stay connected? One of those is the Petal Police Program. Reaching back out with the youth that we gave these bikes to, having them do programming within their community, within their school. From there, we can re, we can recycle those bikes. Once they grow out of those bikes, we can give them another bike while they had passed down the bikes that they had previously to another person or another child that would like to have that bike. And not just limited to youth, but also, you know, expanded to families. I realized that riding bikes with my family has connected us on a different level and we see things from a different perspective. And the main goal is changing the perspective changing the changing the idea of how we're we're able to get around and changing what the cycling world looks like is no longer a um white male activity it's an everybody activity so the next thing is improving creativity creating programs for families like i just stated um barriers and things like that and um, making cycling available for all youth, teaching them all principles of cycling and then better decision-making. Once again, diving into the businesses, diving into um, businesses that want to be more inclusive and how can they help with you and how can they help with other organizations having those conversations. And finally, how can you help Diva Decycling Cycling with this movement? Resource, volunteers, funding. We need donations, bikes, helmets, lights, apparel. How can you participate? We need your energy. We want your time. We want your information. We want you to lead a ride. I can be a resource. I have an amazing partner now that she's um, she's an amazing resource as well here in the Cleveland area and in Ohio. And then just support. 
calling in or emailing me and saying, hey, Diana, I see you right here. Is there anything that you need, such as food, water, whatever may need may need to be, such as um, like SAG support? I have a van. I'm looking for SAG. And then we're looking for funders, sponsors, and partners. There's a big cycling um, experience that is happening here in the Cleveland area for 2021. There's a big projects that are happening and we're diving deep into the community. So we want the funders to support these big um, projects, these big experiences that are happening locally. We want sponsors, local sponsors to come in and support these bike rides, support the opportunity, support Black Girls Dubai Cleveland, support Major Taylor Cleveland, um, and then partners. We wanna partner up with everybody and anybody. If there's a fun activity or fun program that you wanna jump into or do, reach out. We're always looking for a fun way to get people out and bikes are it. And let's stay connected. You can find me on Instagram Instagram, Diva D. You can find me on Facebook under Diva D Cycling and on Twitter um, under D Diva. And if you would like to support Diva D Cycling on PayPal. And then I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, if you want to reach out, if you want more information, I know this was a little rushed, please give me an email at Diva D Cycling at gmail.com. That is D E V A H, the letter D, the word cycling at gmail.com or reach out to me or um, via divadcycling.com, um, which is the website. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I look forward to having fun with every single one of y'all here who are here today on Two Wheels. Awesome, thank you so much, Diana. Um, thank, thank you, you. Monica, Shukoya. Um, really appreciate having you here this morning. I just wanna open up the floor uh, for Q&A real quick. It looks like um, we have a couple questions that came in during your presentations. Um, I think Kea, our moderator, has a couple on deck. Yeah, um, so our first question is for Shukoya. Lindsay is asking, when does the youth program happen for Major Taylor? Uh, I work for Propel Northside and would love to be connected. Uh, so the youth program typically occurs uh, in the spring, um, uh, late March uh, through uh, in then May. And we typically do like a big trip at the end uh, to celebrate the kids. So definitely hit me up. Great, and I think you had your social media and we'll make sure to share everyone's social media again so that folks can get in touch if you need to. Um, another question that came in, this I guess is uh, general for all panelists, is there a way that we can promote bike shops that treat women and people of color with more respect? Uh, we all have, I'm sure, but this person has had some very annoying experiences in shops that treat them like an idiot. And I think that's something we can probably all relate to. Um, if anyone on the panel or from Bike PGH even has some thoughts on this. I get charming. I mean, um, I'm, I'm a little, I, I try to solicit uh, a few bike shops, but I've always had good experiences um, with Kendra Cycles, uh, with Waxwing Cycles, uh, West Liberty uh, Cycles as well. Um, those are where I would take all my bikes and I do take my bikes. Um, and um, I think it helps that two of those shops have uh, female co-owners. So I think that's a huge reason why they maybe don't have those problems because they have women representation in ownership. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess that's really important, right? If you have a bad experience at the shop, you're going to be discouraged. So we want to keep that from happening. Um, I, I agree with all the shops that Shay mentioned. I personally make sure I go to Kindred or Thick Bikes on the south side. Those are my two favorites. Um, always had good experiences there. Um, and to answer the question directly, you know, when you have those good experiences, tell people about it, tell other women about it so that, um, you know, we can let everybody know. We get that question a lot, so it's, a, it's an important one. Great, thank you. And I, I will also like third on there with Kindred, they're fantastic to work with and uh, Thick as well is, is a wonderful partner that we have. So, I mean, those are ones that I personally have had, you know, great experiences with. Um, and then no more really questions, but just a comment. Uh, Kate is very appreciative of the speaker's time and energy. Thank you. And she's learned a lot about these orgs. 
Awesome. Well, I would like to second that comment as well. Um, just wrapping up our first session this morning. Thank you so much, Monica, Diana, and Shakoya for joining us at today's summit. Um, you all are doing such important work and I can't wait to see what you have in store for the coming year. Um, again, whether in person or virtual, uh, we're all excited to see you again soon. Um, right now, we're going to take a quick 15 minute break before we dive into our next workshop where you will learn pro tips and tricks for how to plan your next bike adventure. So uh, you all will head back into the Zoom waiting room where you can grab a snack, stretch your legs, uh, do whatever you need to do, and we will reconvene here at 10.15. All right, see you then.